During Lent, we have taken six Sundays to move through one week, the last week of Jesus' human life. This has allowed us to expand time, to freeze frame important moments, and dig deeper into our faith story, into our own stories. This morning marks the end of Lent and the beginning of our commemoration of Holy Week. So let us speed up time a little bit as we remember the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. for a moment, wondering how we could join Jesus in clearing out our own lives and hearts, our own places of worship, to make them a more welcoming place for the love of God to reside fully. We followed Jesus as he continued to teach in the city and among the people at the temple. His teachings filled our hearts as they filled those long ago. And we remembered the call to proclaim justice in the midst of injustice whenever we find it. We joined the disciples at a table of extravagant affection and overflowing love. And then another supper where all our assumptions about the way the world works were turned upside down. This week, we joined Jesus in the garden. Gethsemane is the moment when a chain of events begins that cannot be halted. Once Jesus is taken into custody, there is no going back. So we pause a moment with him in the garden, just before his arrest, and we feel with him the temptations that arise when facing difficult circumstances. To run, hide, 
use whatever power we have to change things, fight it, perhaps even bargain with God. We walk among the sleepy disciples who just can't grasp what is about to happen. Enter the story, enter the place you belong, not just looking on, for this is your story, enter the story. Let us enter into a time of prayer together, as the words will be on screen for you. Here we are, Jesus. We find ourselves alongside you in a garden of grief for the violence so many of this world endure. We are tired. We don't know what to do next. And so we sleep sometimes, hoping to awake from a bad dream. Forgive us, O oh God. Help us face this hour, knowing you are always here. You only ask the same of us, to be present, to be awake. You entered our story through Jesus. Now help us enter fully into the story of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Friends, know this. We can open to let the story remind us that no matter what we face or how we fail to meet the demand of the moment, second chances are possible. You are forgiven and freed, encouraged and loved by a God who wants you to live fully. Let us enter the passion of Christ. Good morning. Today, we continue our special time of the year called Lent. Now, Lent is a time of growing closer to God, and we are getting so close. Next Sunday is Easter. Booyah! Before we jump into the story for today, let's prepare by doing our echo prayer. We will dare to join the journey. We will dare to join the journey. We will walk your loving way. We will walk your loving way. We will live your sacred story. We will live your sacred story through the things we do and say. Through the things we do and say. Amen. Amen. Today's story is about prayer and it also involves a lot of so listen very carefully and act out the different actions that you hear in the story. Let's go. Jesus and his disciples 
walked, perhaps you want to walk like someone just told you about a surprise birthday party and you see the person who it is and you can't say anything, so maybe you walk like this. Jesus and his disciples walked to a place called Gethsemane, a garden at the foot of the Mount of Olives. He told his disciples, sit. Here while I go pray. Peter and two others walked with Jesus a little way. Then Jesus told them, stay here and keep watch. Maybe I can come up with one more while they fetch my papers. Thank you. Then Jesus went to a spot Lay down face first. Face first. Really? All the face first? Whew, okay. <clears throat> and said to God, My Father, if it is possible, take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not what I want, but what you want. Jesus stood up and walked over to the disciples. He found them sleeping. Wouldn't you stay away for one hour for me? Two more times, he walked over by himself. Two more times, he lay down face first. Okay, I got it. See, all the way down. time, he stood up and walked back to find the disciples sleeping. One of Jesus' closest friends, Judas Iscariot, led soldiers to the garden. As they marched in, Jesus could have tried to run. But he didn't do that. He stood and said, friend, do what you have come to do. Great job with your part of the story. Now Jesus could have done things the easy way and tried to run when he had a chance, but he did not give in to that temptation. Instead, he chose to do things God's way and it would change the world. Jesus knew he could talk to God any place, any time. Still, even Jesus had special places where he felt especially close with God. And the Garden of Gethsemane was one of those places. I would like each of you to silently think about this. Where is a place that you feel especially close to God? A place where you can not only talk to God, but hear what he might be trying to tell you. Now let's just take a deep breath, because I've been running. 
let's close in prayer. Repeat after me. Loving God, loving God, help us know, help us know, we can always talk to you. We can, we can always talk to you. Give us the faith, give us the faith to do things your way. To do things your way. Amen. Jesus' defense in those moments in the garden was prayer, not the sword that one of his disciples wanted to use to protect him. Prayer was its source of power, that God's will would sustain him through the next day. Jesus knows what is about to go down, and he will not use violence in these last hours. The letter to the Ephesians offers us the alternative armor with which we can gird ourselves to work for what is right. Put on God's armor so that you can make a stand against the tricks of the devil. We aren't fighting against human enemies, but against rulers, authorities, forces of cosmic darkness, and spiritual powers of evil in the heavens. Therefore, pick up the full armor of God so that you can stand your ground on the evil day and after you have done everything possible to still stand. So stand with the belt of truth around your waist justice as your breastplate, and put shoes on your feet so that you are ready to spread the good news of peace. Above all, carry the shield of faith so that you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word. Too much wine, perhaps. Or maybe I'm so sleepy because I'm so very tired. This week is taking its toll on me, watching our every step, wondering when the other shoe will drop. Afraid that the commotion stirred up about Jesus will result in something terrible. I've been on edge ever since we got here. But it was a parade, all right. Who would have thought that this man I met on the shores of my fishing spot would turn to be three years of nonstop surprises? The entrance into Jer Jerusalem was more amazing than all of it combined. I felt sure that I was a part of something that would change everything. Now I'm not so sure. Not everyone, it turned out, was so pleased about Jesus' arrival here. And we've been under scrutiny for days. Then tonight, Jesus revealed one of us was going to hand him over. I'm noticing who is missing here in the garden and I'm wondering if maybe he was right. It turns my stomach at the thought of it. I do not want to face that these people who have become my family could turn against one another under pressure. It seems a fear threatens our very bonds. So why put ourselves out here in the open? I need to stay awake to keep watch. I've got my sword. I know Jesus told me not to bring it. But all he seems to think we need to do is pray. He's asking us to pray with him. Yes, I pray. I am praying, and I'll fervently pray. But is it enough? How can God help us if soldiers arrive? And yet, I'm so sleepy. Thank you.
Are things normal? Let me tell you about how I feel about that word. I mean, most definitions usually sound something like this. Conforming to a standard, average, usual, typical, or expected manner. Most of the time when I think about the word normal, it makes me feel like it's sort of a statistical word, a sort of let's take everything together and average it out to understand how to measure normal. And I guess you could actually probably say that normally I'm uncomfortable with this word. What I yearn for today, I guess one could call a desire for a more typical life experience. Today we normally would gather in a, in a nice sanctuary, well decorated, and uh, we'd wave our palm leaves and remember Christ's unexpected, not normally practiced entrance into Jerusalem at the beginning of his final week on earth as a mortal being. But instead, we find ourselves today separated, even isolated, and some even quarantined right now. And somehow coming together to experience a, a sense of the holy, a touch of the divine love expressed through Jesus' life. Perhaps because of this new reality in which we dwell, we can begin to appreciate the precariousness and the precarious nature of Jesus' final days and his final hours. Perhaps we can begin to wrap ourselves into the picture of what it felt like to be with him. Can we feel the drama behind the moment, the life-threatening balance between a parade celebrating Jesus' ministry, stake, staking a claim upon God's people and his followers, while Pilate threatens and the other end of town to remind folks not to get too carried away with this Jesus fella. Today I invite you to be focused on the part of the story that follows the Last Supper when Jesus' betrayer has gone off to, to close the deal with the, with the authorities to arrest him. And Jesus retreats to a quiet place with his three closest disciples, the very ones who have been with him the longest, Peter, James, and John, to be in prayer, to be in conversation with God. Though the Gospels aren't in full agreement on the geographical location of this event or where this set-aside time happened, whether it was across the Kidron Valley or whether it was at the Mount of Olives or in this place called Gethsemane, which actually means olive press. Whatever the place was, I picture a quiet, beautiful place surrounded by nature, away from the crowds. Jesus invites his friends to wait, stay awake, and pray with him as he goes off to be by himself. His prayer reveals the intimacy. Abba, Father, actually more literally translated as Daddy, Daddy, you have the power to take this cup away from me. And I picture these words followed by a very long pause. As if waiting for some kind of confirmation of his plea. And then quietly, in a firm resignation, saying, not my will, but yours. Some ancient manuscripts describe this moment where Jesus is in prayer of having great drops of blood like sweat pouring from his brow. In that precise moment, we capture something beautiful, scary, and powerful. Jesus knows his role, and he accepts it, knowing the cost. Today, Right now, friends, people make the same choice. Please, God, I don't want to die. We could easily hear that from a person in the midst of combat or war or other some very difficult experience. And yet often they must still play their part. 
I was listening to the British Broadcasting Company, the BBC, the other day, and they were doing an interview with a, a nurse who works in a COVID-19 ward. And he said to the interviewer, of course, it was not, it was done virtually, you know. He said, we all cry here on the ward every day. Every day we cry. He then described one particular death of a, of a husband and a father who was in his 30s. He describes watching his gradual failure in complete isolation. The only thing he could ever do was to carry uh, occasionally, when he had the time, a FaceTime opportunity between a dying man and his wife and his 12-year-old boy. And he recalls calling his wife towards the end and saying, he's dying, taking a moment to call her. And then they FaceTime one last time with him. And he said it was heart-wrenching. Then something else happened after the man died he got a call after after his his wife and son heard about this he got a call asking if they could FaceTime one more time with him after his death the nurse was very busy but he he heard the tone in their voices and took a moment for the mother and son to FaceTime one last time with this dead husband and father And as he held that phone, he heard the 12-year-old say, Daddy, don't leave me alone. Daddy, don't leave me. As heart-wrenching as that moment was, the thing that, that is the most profound to me happened in the interview. When, when the interviewer asked him, what did he do? He said, well, after he died, I got him ready to go, cleaned him up. And I went on to the next patient. I went on to the next patient. You can see in these nurses' tears that he wanted to cry out, please, Lord, take this cup away from me. I don't want to die either. I don't want anybody to die. <laughs> and in the end, he chose to go on, knowing there was risk and sacrifice in what he did. As people who, as Christians, we often faithfully pray for others and, and do so with great compassion and concern. But I would remind you, that Jesus demonstrates it is important to pray for yourself. It's a concept reinforced throughout Scripture. In fact, Jesus, hanging on the cross, recites part of Psalm 22 when he cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? It's a personal prayer for himself. Read the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Very personal. It's about you. Or picture the images of Job crying out to God in conversation about why is this happening to me? What seems very clear to me is our need to ask God to help us at times so that we can then pray for and help others in their need. Another part of the story, somewhat uncomfortable for most of us, centers around those three beloved disciples that Jesus trusted to be with him in his time of sorrow and grief and preparation. Who he invited to pray and at least stay awake with him as he prayed. And there, for me, there is one clear takeaway from this part of the story. No matter how close we are to Jesus, to God, no matter how much we love how much we care, we will at times fail 
or falter or fall asleep on the job. Bear in mind, friends, the forgiveness of Jesus, even when he seems bitterly disappointed. He doesn't turn into anger. He doesn't send them away. He doesn't vilify them. In fact, in the end of the larger story, he continues to rely on them to do the work of spreading the good news, of sharing the gospel, of teaching and healing, long after he's done. I've been praying for many of you. I want you to know that. But I'll be honest. I've been achingly praying for myself in the midst of this unforeseen crisis. God, do you really plan on me being pastor now? Do you really plan on me being the pastor now? How can I go on? Don't you see, I don't have all the right tools. I don't have all the right attitudes, all the perfect skills to do this. And God, I don't want to die. I don't want anybody to die. As I've been thinking about it, friends, the truth is I don't want things to go back to normal. I don't want to go back to normal. That might be my own will and desire to hope that it would be that way, that things could be restored to pleasantness and simplicity or whatever we thought normal was. But I don't think that's God's will. I believe God's will is to take this time to pray for ourselves, for each other, and for everyone, and live into a new way of living, of caring for people, and of caring for all of God's creation. The status quo of the past with whatever certainty is it brought are probably gone for now, or certainly at least changing dramatically. And it's time we quit putting ourselves back into the old frames of thinking and instead put ourselves into the new creation God invites us to. Amen. We remember today all who grieve, who feel that they have no way out of their circumstances, and we mourn all who have no choice but to live with violence that threatens their lives. Remember those who work for less violence in the world, creating protection and possibilities for a safer existence for all people. And now I invite you to close your eyes if you're comfortable with that, and in your mind, picture those people in our lives that need our advocacy, our presence, and our prayers today. If you're comfortable to do so in your own home, I invite you to lift aloud the names or places that you would add to our prayers today. Let's take a moment in silence to pray. Holy God, has it been another week already? There are times when we can't tell what day it is and we don't know what to expect. Our calendars look crazy. So many things, so many events, things that we had planned and hoped to accomplish or achieve, so many interactions that we expected that haven't happened, that have been canceled, postponed, perhaps lost. In the midst of all this, God, we ask that you be with us as your people so that what we don't lose is that we know who we are in you and who we are to each other and to the world. 
let us recognize the pains we have and the sorrows we have and the struggles we have. Let's, let's be honest about our feelings of closed in, of, of being unable to get out like perhaps we once used to, of those activities that we've so treasured. But let us treasure the fact that your love stays with us through all this and that you call upon us to do whatever new and untried means we have had to stay safe, but to stay connected. We are those who believe that our strength is being the body of Christ in this world, even in a world which right now seems at times disembodied. But we open ourselves to your guidance and your presence. We, we pray your forgiveness for those things that we fail to do, and we ask your guidance to achieve those things that still lie before us. As we face an uncertain time right now, we don't know when this struggle against a, a relentless foe will fade. But what we do know is that you don't leave us or forsake us, and it is in you that we trust. And we believe in those words, the prayer you taught us all to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey friends, it's Holy Week, and because it's Holy Week, we're going to have more services available for you to view online. On Thursday at 7 p.m., we'll have a Monday Thursday service. Hope you can join us for that. Also, look for some special services on Easter. Hoping you can tune in. Our closing hymn this morning is, Lord, Listen to Your Children Praying.
as you leave this moment of online celebration of Palm Sunday, may you hold images that are new and, and different about the way the world ought to be. May you embrace a deeper understanding of what it means to be the people of God, to be the body of Christ. And as we continue through this most unusual Holy Week on our journey to Easter, remind us that the power of the resurrection is very real in our lives. And may we carry that in our bodies, in our lives, in our minds each and every day. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.